Hey everybody, welcome to our third installment in our series on vertex operator algebras. Today we are talking about structure. Yeah, that's right, we'll be taking algebras apart and putting them back together again. And to that end, we'll study ideals, quotients, and extensions of algebras. So let's get started. The ideal of an algebra is defined from its underlying ring structure. Let I be a linear subspace of some Lie algebra, say G. I is then an ideal if the Lie bracket of anything in G with something in I brings you back to I. Note that this does not require I to be a subalgebra. Okay, let's look at some examples that might be familiar from physics. Consider the set of generators X, P, and H bar, familiar from elementary quantum mechanics. For the uninitiated, H bar commutes with everything, and the bracket of X, P equals I times H bar. From this perspective, the linear span of the singleton H bar is an ideal. Both of the pairs, H bar with X, as well as H bar with P, span ideals as well. Another example comes from the study of space-time symmetries in quantum field theory. Namely, the underlying Lorentz algebra, SO31, breaks into two copies of the Lie algebra, SU2. In this case, each of those copies form a subalgebra, perhaps familiar from the study of left and right-handed spinners, you know, like neutrinos. The algebra, of course, is represented by the famous Pauli matrices and is isomorphic to the imaginary quaternions. Another useful ideal descends from a general Lie algebra homomorphism. Now, the kernel of any map is the set of objects in the domain which map to zero. The kernel of a Lie algebra homomorphism gives you an ideal because it maps all those suckers to zero, so by the algebra homomorphism, that kernel must divide. A particularly common example of such a kernel involves the adjoint map. Indeed, the kernel of the adjoint on a Lie algebra is so important that it gets its own name. We call it the center of the Lie algebra. Okay, so who cares about ideals and why do they matter? Great question. Well, for one, we can use ideals to build quotient algebras. One way to think about that is kind of like a simplification. You simply ignore all the items in a given ideal, or maybe at most consider some representative element, and streamline your algebra that way. To get into the specifics of how that might work, we're going to develop a bit of arrow technology. So here's a quick aside on short exact sequences. Consider a bunch of objects connected by arrows. Some might call those arrows morphisms. In the present context, these objects are typically algebras, but they could also be generic vector spaces. The arrows, of course, represent linear maps between them. In this context, we call a collection of these vector spaces and maps a sequence. A sequence is called exact if the kernel of a given map, a given arrow, is equal to the image of that map that immediately preceded it. <laughs> so, did you get that? Well, to test your understanding, you might convince yourself that the exact sequence from 0 to A to B to C and back to 0 has a few properties. The first is that the zeros are there to imply that the first map is an injection and the last map is a surjection. Indeed, once you write down a diagram like this, a so-called short exact sequence, you're really just encoding a relationship between B and C. We can extend the notion of a quotient algebra by looking at it from the inside out. And to see what I mean, let A and B be Lie algebras. We can define a new Lie algebra, G, by using a short exact sequence. We call this item G the extension of A by B. So we basically build out G by giving it an ideal, B, but otherwise it has the same structure as A. A simple and common way to extend a Lie algebra is to simply add a new dimension to its center, which you can do via a direct sum with the underlying field. Okay, one more aside on arrows and category theory. Let's suppose you have another diagram. This one is a two-dimensional setup, where your vector spaces are arranged in a triangle with maps between them. These ideas will come up again and again, so it's worth getting us all on the same page. Often, it's a useful shorthand. Also, category theorists often prove theorems by chasing arrows around various diagrams like this. Note the orientation of the arrows. We say this diagram commutes if the map little c is equivalent to the composition of maps little a with little b. Commuting diagrams basically means that you can get from one object to another using the arrows or maps, and it doesn't really matter which way you travel. <laughs> 
There's no hysteresis in the loops. You won't gain or lose any information. They are equivalent. Back to extensions. Okay, so using commutative diagrams, we can compare Lie algebra extensions very quickly. Two extensions of a given Lie algebra pair, say A and B, are equivalent if this diagram commutes. Here, we've basically combined two short exact sequences with a map between the extensions. If the diagram does not commute, something goes wrong on one of the paths and the extensions are somehow different. And that's our show! Next time, we'll continue our discussion of algebra structures by considering products of algebras. <laughs> <laughs>